Hello chess friends and welcome to Yazarov Chess Channel and welcome to our Gary Kasparov saga. So in this series we're following Gary Kasparov's life and his career from the year 1981 till 2000 and uh, today we're continuing again with this 1981 USSR Chess Championship it's with a game between, between uh, Gary Kasparov and Alexander Belyavsky. Alexander Belyavsky also respected Grandmaster even these days. Uh, he's a Ukrainian Grandmaster now plays under the Slovenian flag but Alexander Belyavsky was really a great theoretician so it's a very important game that I will show you today because it shows what you really need to focus on in chess. Uh, here Gary Kasparov will show all of the elements of a chess game. So first of all opening preparation, middle game strategies, understanding uh, the bishop's activity, understanding when to go into an endgame, understanding the tiny little things in endgames if you know what I'm talking about because sometimes in the endgames we lose a tempo or we don't play an, an accurate endgame here Gary Kasparov as I said will show us all of the beautiful elements of the chess game that's why I think it's also a very cool game but also a very very instructive chess game played by the legendary beast from Baku so let's check out the game uh, d4 here by Kasparov Belyavsky uh, opened with d5 c4 c6 the Slav defense knight to f3 knight to f6 and knight to c3 for me it was a very cool game because most of the times I played this uh, opening so when my opponent plays something like e6 I go into the exchange variations with c takes d5 but here Belyavsky plays uh, the check variation of the Slav defense with d takes c4 this is a very tricky opening if you don't react correctly because first of all you have to play the move a4 if you don't play the move a4 if you try for instance uh, to grab some space with the move e4 then you get b5 immediately and you will have troubles uh, to protect your center so that's why a4 very important to block uh, black's progress on the, on the queen side with the potential b5 move but there is one problem about this a4 move which is as i said a necessary move the problem about this move is that you're leaving also some spaces behind first of all your b3 square is weak your b4 square is weak so black will try uh, to occupy this squares b4 b3 and the other thing what is black what black is trying to do is then after a slow uh, build up with with the minor pieces then to crack the position with the move c5 and e5 what white has of course in the beginning is the spawn central control it means we have now a two versus one situation in the center which could be good if we could advance maybe the pawn on e4 then get something out of it and grab this pawn on c4 then it could be a comfortable game but it's not so easy the check variation of the slav defense is really really a tricky one so here bishop to uh, f5 never allow this um, e4 move to happen immediately so at least you see black is preventing this e4 idea so that's why you have to play e3 white cannot play on the spawn central control immediately has to also be patient in, in this game after the move e6 we have bishop to c4 and you see now bishop to b4 so this is already common theory of this uh, variation and you see black is continuing with this uh, normal ideas with the pinning idea and then c5 e5 possibility so castling played by Kasparov we have a knight to d7 played by Belyavsky and queen to b3 this is also the same say uh, the same uh, line I'm playing uh, most of my times with queen to b3 attacking the bishop on b4 there are now several choices we can play queen to e7 or a5 uh, queen to e7 is in some occasions a problematic move uh, I know what I'm talking about as I said I really uh, played this uh, variation many many times so after the move queen to e7 not immediately but as a long-term plan uh, white can proceed then uh, with the move a5 can push uh, the pawn further so there are problems for black then to handle this advanced pawn on the fifth rank so that's why if you play queen to e7 then the a5 pawn wouldn't be protected anymore so here uh, that's why a5 the most natural way to proceed here for black we have knight to a2 also common theory what from white's perspective you should do in the first place when you have this position this is now a many many times played position um, here you should always chase this bishop or this bishop uh, this bishop can be chased with knight to h4 moves this uh, bishop can be chased with uh, no move, moves as knight to a2 so knight to a2 played by Kasparov bishop to e7 a m better idea I believe for black is to play bishop to d6 it's more aggressive 
as uh, black has always uh, the opportunities to play, play maybe on a Greek gift idea with bishop to, uh, bishop to h7, knight to g4, again in long terms of, of course, but that would be possible if uh, white, continue, if you could just imagine, so bishop to d6, if uh, white chases the bishop now with knight to h4, there are always, always this tactical threat with um, bishop takes h2 followed with knight to g4, queen takes h, uh, h4. So these are the tactical problems of white and white would love, as I said, white would love to get this pawn somehow on e4, but it's not possible. Still, we have two pawns in the center, but e4 is long-term plan in the game bishop to e7 played by Baliaski, and again you see kasparov plays on the same same idea to chase the bishops when you have this uh um, as i said position against the uh, check variation of the slav defense please um chase the bishops uh because there are always uh, also some tactical threats if for instance black moves bishop to e4 even around the square e6 you should calculate these tactics very well of course but Bishop to e6 in some occasions is also a tactical possibility. So here, bishop to g6 played by, and now g3. The idea behind this move is to cement our knight. There are, as I said, maybe some discovered attack possibilities on the knight. What we want to do is, again, build f3, e4, pawn central control. So that's why queen to c8 uh, here by Beliavsky protecting the b7 pawn. There are also some lines in which white takes the pawn on b7. It's really a complicated line with follow with c5 and rook to b8 is also a good idea for black. In the game, queen to c8 played by Beliavsky, now knight to c3. We have castling and now knight takes g6, h takes g6 and now rook to d1. e4 immediately is possible of course but it can be met with the potential e5 that's uh the problem after potential d5 black do uh, black doesn't need to react black can also wait a little bit here so the idea of gary kasparov's uh to here to play the more rook to d1 to support the d4 pawn is a very natural one because c5 and e5 are uh, happening anyway in the game so if that happens after potential c takes d4 e takes d4 after e takes d4 we would have maybe an isolated pawn but it's supported by the rook and we would still have the possibility to push it further because the main idea of the isolated pawn is to advance the pawn somehow with potential d5 moves so you see the d5 square is very well protected by the queen bishop and knight so that in this position an isolated pawn wouldn't be such a problematic thing so here e5 as i said we have uh bishop to f1 uh, by kasparov uh, bishop to b4 again uh if black for instance takes e takes d4 e takes d4 you see we have always but really always the opportunity to play d5 immediately this potential blockade with knight to b6 is also a risky one we could play bishop to uh, g5 developing our bishop so what black uh, doesn't want to do is somehow liberate your dark square bishop because the dark square bishop of ours is uh, here the worst minor piece on the board after potential e takes d4 and e takes d4 you see the bishop will have an activity so that's why beliavsky tried again this move bishop to b4 we have a bishop to g2 and great maneuver uh, here by kasparov now the bishop is perfectly fine here here we have rook to e8 a knight to a2 again the same idea chasing the bishop uh bishop to f8 and again bishop to d2 now we want to maneuver our bishop on c3 and again support of uh, d4 pawn. so here g5 what beliavsky is trying to do here is to play something like g4 then maybe even e4 and maybe somehow in some occasions cement one of these knights on a very very weak square f3 still we have the light square bishop the light squares are protected by our uh, very nice bishop but it's really a tricky idea so g5 uh, as a strategic idea is perfectly fine here we have rook to c1 and now g4 great great move so the King side is a little bit paralyzed by the single pawn here in the game. Kasparov plays again the natural knight to c3, and we have queen to b8, uh, queen to c2. Now preparing uh, finally maybe this e4 pawn breakthrough here, queen to a7, and now the pawn on d4 is really in danger. So that's why Gary Kasparov advanced the pawn on d5. As I said, we are not risking some uh, weak squares, weak pawn positions, and in the game Beliavsky takes. C takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, knight to f6, and now bishop to a2. Okay, let's evaluate the position. 
this is now really an open game. Uh, Gary Kasparov has accomplished now a good position, I believe, with the bishop pair. The bishops can find a way into the game. But again, it's really a tough uh, middle game because uh, this pawn, as I said, is really annoying. Uh, there are several light square problems. So the dark square bishop is perfectly fine of blacks also. We can trade it off maybe and open the A file. Could be also a very powerful idea. And now comes really the difference maybe between Kasparov and Berliavsky. Here Kasparov will show how to play these types, types of positions. He plays simply after the move b6, queen to f5. This is the idea of the most active square. We're searching always uh, where is the best position for a queen. So queen to f5 creates again really some tricky ideas. g6 is not a possibility. It will uh, follow with the queen takes g6 you cannot take. So the queen cannot be kicked away so far uh, from the action. That's why queen to b7 was played, bishop to c3. Both bishops are really aiming on the most active diagonals. We have uh, queen to uh, f3. And here Beliavsky tries to simplify the position with uh, by trades of queens. But it's really not a problem for Gary Kasparov after queen takes f3 and g takes f3. Okay, uh, maybe we don't have such a dynamic game anymore. But um, again, this is a bishop pair. Uh, pawns are on both sides. We should always favor our bishops when pawns are on both sides if uh, pawns would be only on one side then the knights could be f perfectly fine in an end game but bishops are, are very uh, very nice here and uh, here Gary Kasparov plays a great move g4 it's a sacrifice uh, of a pawn but it's only temporarily because after knight takes g4 now Gary Kasparov plays an active move rook to d7 so the knight was of course protecting the d7 now this rook is very very active uh, you have to take care of the rook here knight to h6 you see the knight is only used now as a protect uh, protective piece but that was all possible because of this very very nice sacrifice on g4 now bishop to d5 great move by kasparov we have rook to c8 and now bishop takes f3 now the position gets more and more better uh, for kasparov we have bishop to uh, b4 and now bishop to d5 uh, we have rook to d8, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, and now e4. Uh, we have rook to c8, uh, f3, cementing our pawn on uh, e4, and also creating a clear, clear path for our king, because in a an endgame, the king should always play towards the center. Now, the king doesn't have to be protected by the minor pieces. The queens are off the board. The position is much more simplified. Now, it's really time to activate our king. Bishop to d uh, d6, we have king to f2, we have king to f8, king, king to e2, f6 and now uh, h4 we have knight to f7 king to d3 uh, king to e8 we have rook to g1 attacking the spawn king to f8 get back here it's like kasparov uh, says you're not going to play actively with your king uh, your king has to protect uh, protect the pawn uh, here rook to b1 now there are maybe some possibilities here to open uh, the position and the main advantage i believe in this position as i said that's why I liked really this endgame is that Gary Kasparov's king is more in the center than this uh, uh, king of Beliavsky because as I said the king has to be treated like a piece and now there is also a clear path for the king to go and go after this weak b6 pawn so in the game knight to uh, h8 h5 we have knight to uh, f7 and now b4 uh, a takes b bishop takes uh, now rook uh, rook to d8 Bishop takes d6, and after rook takes d6, you see now, here comes Gary Kasparov's path. Of course, you have to uh, protect first your uh, f3 pawn with rook to b3. We have f5, and now king to b5. Here, uh, f4, king to a6, and now king to e7. And I believe that most of us, but really, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but at least 70% of us would immediately take uh, this pawn on b6. But not Gary Kasparov. He realized that he has to play much more actively with the king. Because if we take immediately, th this king will come probably uh, into the defense. Then uh, black could have a comfortable game. Black could afterwards maybe take the pawn on f3. Uh, also attacking here this uh, pawn on h5. So here Gary Kasparov plays really such a beautiful endgame move. He plays rook, uh, king to b7. It's not the same if we take if we allow this king to come on the d file or on the on the c file if they, if this can, uh, king comes in the on the c file it's really uh, it's really a problem so here after move uh, rook to h6 now Gary Kasparov takes 
after rook takes b6 king takes b6 and you see this king is out of game uh the rook uh, the king on um e7 and now uh, here alexander belyavsky takes knight takes f3 but now you see because the king is now on the b file we have a clear path uh, of the pawn on a uh, on the a file and you see now how important it was to get our king there so uh, we have a6 we have uh, f3 now both players will uh, promote to a queen but now you see this uh, move king to c7 was a great endgame technique because after queen to c1 we have the opportunity to cover with bishop to c6 not that we have only covered our king no checks are possible by black we have also this very annoying check on on e8 and then after after that we can also attack the weak pawn on g7 so uh, knight to e4 we have queen to e8 king to f6 you see queen to g6 and we take now this pawn uh, queen to e6 after queen to uh, g4 again a new move a uh, king to f7 but now queen to g6 uh, king has to move to f8 and now h6 in this position uh, Belyavsky resigned because in the next move you're going to be checkmated here on g7 there's nothing you can do great great endgame technique here by Kasparov uh, and he won the game it was a tough game I believe because you see that uh, Belyavsky played also on some very interesting ideas but this was really from the beginning nice opening preparation nice middle game strategies and then nice end game technique by the beast from Baku, and he won the game with, with such a great performance so okay i hope that you enjoyed this game i really enjoyed it a lot it was really instructive chess game if you want to see more gary kasparov's games here's the link uh, to his uh, uh, saga and if you want to see the best chess games of all time check out my best chess games of all time series and you can also subscribe to my channel if you like this content Thank you for watching guys and uh, chess is the best of course.